Now, when you talk about management of IGF-1 deficiency, the options, of course, include the treatment of uh, growth hormone, uh, uh, which can be given, or you can give IGF-1. So, in growth hormone deficiency, why don't we give IGF-1? Why do we go give growth hormone? So, because growth hormone has other effects also. Yes, very good. So, it has got other effects other than IGF-1. Second? Uh, less hypoglycemia. Okay. Third? It increases IGF, IGF binding protein. So, the half-life of IGF-1 is more. Free IGF-1 is less. So, that is why if you have GHD, GH is the treatment of choice. There were a lot of people who talked about Increlex or IGF-1 as the modality which will replace growth hormone. But that did not happen because growth hormone is a physiological treatment from that perspective. In growth hormone insensitivity syndrome, which is genetically proven, there you can think of IGF as a treatment or as I discussed, GHD-1A with antibodies. So recombinant IGF-1 or mecasermin is basically indicated for proven GH insensitivity. Height and IGF-1 SGS should be below minus 3. So clearly it's not that your IGF-1 is borderline, it's very low. It will be very short, very low IGF-1. It has to be given twice a day, 80 to 120. Dr. Vibha will talk much more in detail about IGF-1 deficiency. And there is no benefit of giving a higher dose. Expected response is that you expect 1 to 2 SDS over 5 to 10 years. What is the expected response with growth hormone? So in the first year, there will be around 10 to 12 centimeter rise in the mm -hmm. height. And subsequently next year, 8 to 10 centimeter and total SDS. So will when you say 10 to 12 centimeters, how much SDS will you increase? One, for the first two years to 1.5 SDS. Good. So when you say 12 centimeters. Normal child will increase by 6 centimeters. Yes, sir. So, you've got plus 6. Yes, and 6 is roughly 1 STS. So, you can roughly say 1 in the first and 0.5 in the second. So, typically, you will get 1.5 in 2 years. Here, you're talking about 1.5 in 5 to 10 years, which basically tells us that IGF-1 treatment is less efficacious compared to growth hormone yes. therapy, which you have to be cautious about from that regards. So, this is what I was talking about, comparison of growth hormone versus IGF-1. So, growth hormone will stimulate growth hormone receptor. It will produce IGF-1 at sites where you want it to be produced. It also will have increase in the glucose level. It will increase IGF-BP3. So, it will in a way control the unexpected rise in IGF-1, which you don't want. So, IGF-BP3 will become more. While you give IGF-1 only, it is going to act at the IGF receptor. There will be no paracrine effect. In fact, IGF BP3 may in fact go down because you are suppressing the IGF 1 level. So, it's not a better therapy from that perspective. So, there is no paracrine effect with IGF 1. You have a risk of hypoglycemia and IGF BP3 levels will become low in that perspective. So, you give a trial of GH if there is no genetic evidence for 3 to 6 months. Lack of response in the form of growth velocity or increase less than 2.5 centimeters is suggesting that there is a resistance. And then you give IGF-1 at a low dose and be careful about hypoglycemia. So always you have to give a carbohydrate meal prior to the IGF-1 injection. So it should be 20 minutes after meal. There is a higher chance of benign intracranial hypertension, higher chance of adenotonsillar hypertrophy because your free IGF-1 may go sky high. And allergic reactions may also happen in that perspective. Starting from the history, it was first described in the 1966. And initially, it was classically associated with the monogenic defect on the growth hormone receptor gene only. But later on, as the uh, more discoveries has been done, there many etiological causes have been identified. And they are, we know the primary growth hormone insensitivity syndrome uh, in the growth hormone receptor defects, which could be extracellular, transmembrane, intracellular, abnormalities or inactivated mutation in the STAT5B, ALS defective, which causes the this bio inavailability of the IGF-1, bioinactive IGF-1, primary defect of the synthesis and action of IGF-1, and there are the secondary causes as well. There are two uh, other uh, very rare causes, that is the inactivating mutation in the PAP-A2, which is the placental associated protease. And uh, it is uh, mainly it affects the bioavailability of the IGF-1 and uh, it makes uh, the less availability of the IGF-1 and it causes the growth failure. Another one is the inactivating mutation in the IGF-2 level as well. 
so we know we all are aware of the classical growth hormone insensitivity which is the laren syndrome it has a very specific features and we can identify the patient on the clinical uh, opd as well uh, these patients have extreme postnatal growth failure they will have if they are not treated on time they gen and even after the treatment as well they will have childhood and adult short stature the cranial facial disproportion and they will be mid hypoplasia as you can see in the picture there is a, a mid facial hypoplasia and uh, they are compressed their this uh, horizontal diameter of the skull is very less as compared to the vertical they will have sparse and thin hairs with thin skin and they will have premature aging as well they will have micro penis their motor developmental will be delayed as everything is very short so they will have small hands and feet they'll have delayed puberty dentition will be delayed there will be the permanent uh, uh, this uh, existence of the primary dentition they'll have more frequent dental caries and most importantly the fasting they'll have uh, the side effect of fasting hypoglycemia they have intolerance to fasting and dyslipidemia now there is another entity which is non classical growth hormone insensitivity they present as a mild short stature and their phenotype is completely normal so the many causes that we have studied at the cause of growth hormone insensitivity they generally present with mild growth to failure and if we look into the causes we all know these one is the growth hormone uh, receptor defect that heterozygous dominant negative the growth hormone receptor pseudo exon step 5b heterozygous dominant negative igf1 igf2 heterozygous variant igf als and pep a2 these all will present with mild short stature typically they will not have classical feature of the growth hormone insensitivity like the mid facial hypoplasia deafness microcephaly intellectual delay pubertal delay you know deficiency except for the step 5 1 if we look into the biochemical profile they will all have igf1 deficiency except for the pap a2 which uh, has increased igf1 their igvp3 level will be low als will be low and growth hormone levels in all these cases will be high as these are growth hormone insensitive features so coming to the approach to the growth hormone insensitivity there is a flow chart as sir has already mentioned that we start and we uh, look into the causes and we start the evaluation only when there is a logical criteria of high standard deviation less than minus 3 standard deviation and we got some uh, clues on the physical examination as well we go for the basal growth hormone because uh, in the if we have significant classical clinical features which are suggestive of insensitivity definitely a single basal growth hormone uh, will help us in making the diagnosis igf1 level igf bp3 and the prolactin level uh, when the growth hormone level prolactin and the igf is high and igf1 is low igf bp3 is normal and low then we can think of two conditions one when the igf bp is high then we have to go for the igf1 generation and when we found the insufficient test result definitely it is a laren syndrome and we have to confirm uh, this confirm it by genetic analysis when along with all these biochemical parameters there is a immune dysfunction chronic pulmonary disease then definitely it goes more in the favor of step 5b mutation and finally the confirmation has to be done by the why are they talking about prolactin levels i don't know sir why specifically because it's not making any difference also so mainly growth hormone is a better marker in that perspective um might be the growth hormone and prolactin they both increase in the so that's so yeah, but, but it will not make any difference uh-huh. if we do not so do. i think growth hormone alone would be a good marker yes. so maybe when you begin with you can do a growth hormone igf1 that will be a better marker in less than 5 years you can go for igf1 and bp3 both yes. so the first term is very clear you have got high growth hormone low igf1 So in that scenario, you have to start working on that. So IGF BP also is not making much difference. Yes. Sir. If you see in any of those arms, IGF one BP three alone is not making much of a difference. Ah, yeah. uh, ex- if uh, yes, except for the this uh, ALS deficiency, the IGF BP three is low. 
and uh, in rest of the cases it is more of a normal so igf1 will make hmm. a difference and if igbp3 though igf1 is also low so there is not much discrepancy so i think age specific is better yes. yeah and probably we need to maybe change with this algorithm as they are always going to genetic analysis now yes so beyond the level maybe rather than going too much biochemical as for dsd genetics would be something which is important so coming to the ig generation test uh, whenever uh, it has to be scheduled at least 30 days later in a patient who has underwent a growth hormone stimulation test not before it um, initially the fasting uh, blood sample is done at the baseline and then we initiate giving growth hormone injection uh, we administer growth hormone subcutaneously with a dose of 0.1 unit daily for four days there are different school of thoughts some says for the four days some says for the five and some says for the seven days also so we can uh, go for either for the four days or uh, either for the four days or for the seven days and uh, even for the collection of the sample uh some study says that you have to draw the sample morning sample each day before giving the growth hormone to measure the igf levels but there was a few studies which say first collect the baseline growth hormone sample then you can uh, collect at the end of the four injections so we can do either way and uh, to interpret the results that how do we go for the interpretation if there is a increase in three fold rise of the level of igf1 or at the day 4 the igf1 is reaching the upper limit that is expect uh, that is more that will go in the if the igf1 level increases that will go against the igf1 deficiency in bioinactive growth hormone that is the kowalski syndrome the igf1 level will increase uh, to 30 nanogram approx and uh, in igf bp3 will also increase to 400 nanogram but in case of larens it will not increase um, both the igf1 it will be below 15 and igf bp3 it will be below 400 now coming to the norms the what the igf levels that we should go for what are the age specific what are the chronological age so as sir has already talked so about so i think if we go on to this uh, this is a important one which you talked about igf generation so if you look at any of the tests you talk about hcg test if you talk about water deprivation test there will be hundreds of protocol yes. so you have to just stick to one protocol and find it the concept is very simple there should be no rise in growth hormone after giving no rise in igf1 yes. after giving growth hormone yes. so everybody will say 15 20 but generally the rule will be there and in severe cases you will not see any, any response but now if you talk about that if you have proven also you have to do a genetic study yes and without genetic study they say you give a trial of growth hormone hmm. so i think ultimately what we are looking at is that if you have a low igf1 and a basal growth hormone more than 5 rather than doing all that you can go for genetics yes. because what this will be very expensive you have to do a basal igf1 give growth hormone for some time do a stimulated igf1 then look into rather than you go for the genetics that will give you a better picture now coming to the uh, this is the normative data for the ij1 like what level we are, are normal for the age specific uh, child gro- uh, age group so this is the percentile curve which is for the chronological age these are different for the boys and the girls so we can look this, whether the uh, this uh, level is below the 50th centile or it is above so uh, and again uh, sir has already discussed that it has to be the bone age specific criteria also so they have provided it as well the bone age specific criteria for ig percentage so, for what were the you sample size in this case 3000 3000 it was a good sample yes, size sir. so if you talk about 3000 it becomes two genders so 1500 per group roughly and then you have got 12 13 ages yes sir so it's like 100 people yes. so minimum 60 is required for any So age and group yes. if you say 1 to 2 years you need to have 60 so they have got good numbers from that uh, so they have provided the percentile curves as, as well as they have the tables also for the proper uh, if we want to see the uh, this level okay. so the yeah. tables have also been provided in the study yeah. and uh, the tenor they have also given the tenor yeah. stage specific igf1 level this is what i was talking important. about so a 12 year old who has a testicular volume of 2 ml yes. is not the same as somebody who has a testicular volume of 16 ml their igf1 will vary so here it is very good that you can really compare it using a 
testicular yes. volume or a tanus yes. stage now um, based on these all chronological fe uh, features and ig1 levels a scoring system has been provided for the diagnosis of the laren syndrome and it uh, comprises that oxological parameters that is uh, if it is less than minus 3 standard deviation we give it to a one score in the basal gh they have uh, taken the cut cutoff of more than 2.5 and if the basal ig1 is less than 50 and basal igf vp3 is uh, uh, below minus 2 standard deviation and igf after the igf generation test if it is not more than 15 if it is less than 15 and igf vp3 is less than 400 and uh, the gh binding percentage is uh, just 10% then they calculate all these score and the score is more than 10 more than 5 uh, then it is the supportive for the diagnosis of the laren syndrome so coming to the treatment uh, this is uh, well described with us sir the treatment is the recombinant uh, growth of human ig1 preparation which comes with a brand name of increlix and the component is micasermin it comes in the 4 ml vials which contains around 4 uh, 40 mg of recombinant ig1 and uh, the cost is uh, $60000 per 4 vials for so 4 vials will be $60000 and uh, the recommended dose is 40 to 120 microgram per kg and it has to be given subcutaneously twice daily it has to be started with the lower dose of 40 to 80 microgram per kg twice daily and if the dose is well tolerated with the during the first week then only the dose is increased 40 microgram for each application and the maximum dose is 120 microgram per kg also we should not exceed above 120 and uh, the height growth increases from this is came from a study i will show it later it uh, it increases from 2.9 to 8.8 cm per year so this is substantially lower than growth yes. hormone deficiency if you look at other treatments like vasorotide how much does do you think the height increases cnp receptor agonist in uh, fibrous uh, dysplasia again it's like 6 cm so it's, it's not too much yes, so ultimately other than growth hormone if you look about cost benefit ratio of most drugs are not good and it has also shown some improvement in the dysmorphic facial features lipolytic effects and impact on the musculoskeletal mass now coming to the side effects of micasermin uh, it causes hypoglycemia it is most prevalent within the first month of treatment and inadequate nutrition and exercise within the 2 to 3 hours after the injection it increases the risk of hypoglycemia and so it is advised not to skip the meal or take carbohydrate 20 minutes before the injection and dose should be reduced in the patient with hypoglycemia in spite of adequate nutrition on uh, the side of it also comprises there will be there could be mild hypotension headache transient papillary edema and increase in the bmi so and it should not be used in a patient those who have a tendency to develop malignancy because it increases the ig1 levels now there is a study which uh, uh, describes the long term treatment and the effect of the ig1 level as we can see in this uh, graph we, uh, the if you see the pre treatment height and the, uh, after the one two years we can easily see there is an increase in the standard deviation score from 59 this uh, from four this when the height was uh, around 3 uh, to 4 cm per year it has increased to 8 cm per year in most of the cases and uh, if you see the final height as uh, uh, in the patients after the treatment so some has got 164 also after the treatment uh, when their initial height was only 111 at 9.7 years of age and uh, coming to the metabolic uh, effect of the this mica sermin it has increases the bmi because it increases both the lean mass and the body fat as i discussed earlier it improves the facial dysmorphism as you can see the child at the 2 years of age and after the 14 years of age the child, the facial features have completely become normal